All right, Phil, I want to welcome you to the show today. Thanks. Really appreciate you taking me on, Bill. Yeah, absolutely. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I'm, I'm in Annapolis and you're not too far away. I've had interviews all around the world. And we, we've met each other during the plague, you know, through the, through the, through the, the TV screen here. Um, but, you know, you're also a Naval Academy grad. Why don't, why don't you just give, give, uh, my, uh, give, give my listeners a little bit of an overview of who you are. Um, and then we'll dive into some of the cool stuff I, you and I are going to talk about. Sure. Okay. Well, so uh, I am a Naval Academy graduate, as you said. Um, and uh, That's the Annapolis uh, connection. The Annapolis. That, that's right. That's right. Of course. And um, majored in English, of all things. I had actually been coding since I was about nine or ten years old um, in the public school system in Louisiana. But um, when I got to the Naval Academy, everyone expected me to major in computer science. And I said, you know, I, I, I like I like dealing with computers, but I also like being able to walk away from them because sometimes you just get a flat spot on your forehead working with them. Um, and so I said, I'm not going to major in computer science. I'm not going to do technology as a career. And yeah, look at where I am now. So um, <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Um, they, we talked about that before because I was, a, I'm an English major as well. Yeah. It confuses people like to no, no end. They're like, what? You're, you're yeah. an IT company and you're in technology for 20, 30 years and you're, but I think you and I talked about this prior, you know, I just think that translating esoteric poetry from the 1400s, how is that any different than translating technology? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, so I left the Naval Academy um, and, uh, and, and drove ships for, for five or six years after I graduated, um, had a great time, uh, saw lots of the world, but then decided I needed a different kind of challenge, and so I moved over to be an intelligence officer. Um, that wound up taking me all over the world. So I lived in Hawaii, Australia, Japan, uh, Greece. I was a diplomat in Greece, and then um, back to the, to the U.S. So I had a full career in the Navy, um, uh, left the Navy back in, in 2016, and um, my final tour in the Navy, I was at the Naval Academy uh, working in the IT department. Um, so believe it or not, that, that the IT and intelligence uh, folks are sort of in the same what we call community in the Navy. And so um, it was a sort of a natural translation for a final tour in the Navy. So I worked there. And um, through some connections in the community, I'm, I'm very involved in the community with the uh, Rotary Club and that sort of thing. Um, through some connections in the community, I connected with a hospital that was uh, searching for a CIO. And um, yeah, so, so sort of, you know, fell into exactly the career I'd been avoiding all my life. Um, and uh, <laughs> so um, I think it, um, it, it, it's been a very, uh, you know, I'd like say I'm learning with a fire hose and getting wet. Um, you know, been doing this for four, a little over four years now, but uh, well, six years total, if you count the two years in the Naval Academy. But I think, um, you know, I, I don't have the t-shirt. Uh, from from all those years and 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 you know no disrespect to those who who do have it but I really don't want it um, um, I want to I want to look at everything with fresh eyes um, and I want to be looking you know towards the future and, and not um, at the past and so um, you know, you t-shirt to... what do you mean by t-shirt Phil well I mean sort of that um, that that you know, been there, done that. This is the way we always solve the problems, that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to be looking for, um, and there is no doubt that experience matters and, 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 and knowledge matters. Um, but at the same time, you know, getting stuck in some of those ruts just really, um, I think, um, causes problems for business. And um, so um, it, it's really about reimagining, especially in the future we're in now, um, reimagining uh, things. You know, I, I read a statistic that said that, um, you know, a a freshman starting college um, today, um, of course, today is a little different, but as freshman co starting college today, um, by the time they graduate, there will be careers um, available to them that did not exist the day that they started. You know, that's an amazing uh, statistic, you know, staggering that, um, that, that in, in less than four years, whole new fields of, of opportunity open up. So um, you have to be looking forward. I mean, just look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, Zoom backgrounds, you know, and oh, yeah. logo development. I mean, the, the, the skills that, 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 that pop up just from background, Zoom background development, or, you know, since social media got was the rage, you know, the social media development and the stacking and the tiering of people needed um, the writing capability. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, yeah, it's I have, I have a sophomore going into sophomore year, 
in college and going into freshman year and, and, and then a senior in high school. And yeah, I mean, just the whole, uh, we, we talked about this, you know, what does the future look like? Mm-hmm. And I, there's an advantage. I, I, cause a lot of people listening were like, hold on four years. He's a CIO major hospital system. How did this happen? You know, cause people spend their whole careers, right. you know, and, and all of a sudden you're like, right, right to the top. And I think there's an advantage of not having baggage. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, diminish the experience and knowledge that, that a lot of my colleagues have. And certainly it's, it's valuable, but I think um, if you, if you're always sort of looking at what, what we did before um, that's not the, the today we're in. And especially during these times, you know, you, you gotta be looking forward. And so um, I, I really think that bringing um, a, a leadership toolkit and, a, and, a, and all those soft skills um, into a, uh, industry is really most important uh, in terms of, of building a future. Um, and, you know, sort of being an intelligence officer in the Navy was all about, um, you know, not considering what's happening today, but what are the implications for not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow and the day after that of what happened today. And so um, you're always looking at third and fourth order of magnitude um, changes, yeah. So, so, yeah, let's go down that route for a moment. So as an intelligence officer, I don't know a lot about what intelligence officers do. Like, what is it pattern recognition? I mean, are you, obviously the machines um, uh, it can help with pattern recognition because you have, you can find the needle in the haystack for, through, through finding intelligence, but where does the human like what, how does a human uh, aspect really come to play as an intelligence officer? Oh, I think it's um, an enormous translation to, to what I do now. Um, starting with, you know, as you say, the, the data analytics and, and the processing and all that sort of thing, the machine application um, to the data. But, um, but the human side of things is incredibly important. So um, as an intelligence officer, your job is to review all of this massive amount of data that uh, the U.S. intelligence community has collected and then to, to collate all that, synthesize all of that, combine it with your understanding of the target that you're looking at, and then begin to put it all together. So you may have some very hard data points about what, what's going on. This is always sort of the source of, of, uh, of challenge in the Intel community. You have the guys who are very hard on the data, but then you had guys like me who um, studied the, the target. Um, I worked one particular country for, for quite a while. Um, you know, and so you read about, you know, the 5,000 year history of that con- com- country and you understand sort of how culturally how they work. So you're looking at this hard data and going, that just doesn't make sense. Um, unless I layer on this other understanding of the, of the culture and the way these people work. And so <clears throat> it becomes really important to understand, um, you know, the totality of what you're looking at and then to, to think differently about what all of that means. Um, and so, of course, you're looking at, um, you know, here, here's this data set that I'm looking at today. You know, what, what decisions are, are is that going to key? What decision is that going to key? And then um, what's the decision that's going to follow that? And what's going to follow that? And of course, that results in a, in a chain of decision making that, you know, just gets wider the further you yeah. go out. And so, um, and then of course, you have to turn around and communicate all that um, back to leadership and, um, and, and then help leadership make the best decisions. Mm-hmm. I had a boss in Australia who said, um, you know, the, the best intelligence officer is really almost never right. And, uh, and, and, you know, I sort of look funny, but, you know, if you think about it, a, a good, um, and, and of course, all this translates into, into business, um, a person who's really good at looking forward and figuring out where the problems are going to be, um, you know, they, they talk about those problems and they provide the information in a way that leadership can then make decisions to mitigate the impact of those problems. So um, if, if you're always predicting that um, we're, we're going to have a, a pandemic, but then the leadership is always taking action to prevent the pandemic from happening, you're the worst planner ever. <laughs> Even though all the data says, uh, you know, this is what, so, so confusing the worst intelligence officer and the best intelligence officer is pretty easy because they're both equally as right. Oh, wow. Wow. You know, it's interesting. I just read this book called Range. Did I tell you, did I, did I share that uh, in the last group session, The Range? You did, yeah. 
the big the big uh, research thesis that came from that is that um, that specialization is not going to win in the in the modern world, and right. which completely is the um, contradictory to our modern education system, where they want to dive people down deep rat holes of of knowledge, but um, but they end up missing the width and seeing and seeing the bigger picture, and which which which. I look at Eng- English for me and, and history are the same thing. You know, yeah. you got yeah. you got to understand the time frame to understand why the heck Beowulf. You can barely understand what you're reading, right. and uh, Dickens. You know, and what was happening in England historically at that time. Right. So it's interesting that you were in the intelligence community in that country, and 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 looked at the tribal nature of that. But this goes back five thousand years and trying to extrapolate. Uh, forward momentum, you know, where it was going to end up. And to me, that's range. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, people who focus too much on on the events of today um, always sort of wound up, you know, sort of missing out on the broader implications of things. And um, But, you know, just as important as it is to understand all that, it's, in, and this is where the English major thing really comes in handy, is the ability to communicate that. Mm-hmm. So you can have the, 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 the best assessment of where things are going to go in the business community and where, where are the industries headed. Um, but if you're not able to communicate that back up to the, to the stakeholders, out to the stakeholders or up to decision makers, then um, you're really ineffective anyway. So it, you're right. It's really, it's really about the broad set of skills. So um, re- related to, re- related to your role. So as a, as a Navy, um, as a Navy officer, there's, you know, it's because uh, the plebes come to my house. I see how, what they go through, you know, through freshman year through, and I know it's not called freshman year. What's it called? First year. First year. What's that? Plebe year. Plebe yeah. year to first year, yeah. yeah. So, um, so we have the plebes coming, staying at, at our place, and we and I see that uh, how they build these uh, these these guys and, and ladies into into officers, and and um, this you know it's very it's a structured existence, you know, and 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 then so there's a lot of known, and so how how do you navigate? And, and I want to extrapolate this to some of the leadership today in today's environment. So you have this very uh, rigorous background, but then within it, you you essentially know that you need width and capabilities. So how do you how do you bring that to bear on the current hospital and maybe bring us up to speed on like how you're th- how you think about the current problems moving forward? Well, I think, um, you know, what what I learned throughout my career and still apply today is uh, that ability to one, um, you know, orient uh, where, where am I right now? Um, and then analyze, okay, how do I, where am I trying to go? What, what, how do I get there? Um, and then plotting a path through all that and then sort of just sort of always revisiting, um, that. And so, uh, it, we're taught that it's called the OODA loop. Um, no. OODA loop, O-O-D-A. It's, okay. um, yeah. Orient, uh, observe, orient, decide, act. Okay. Um, so, so if you're always following the OODA loop, um, then you know you're you're observing what's happening around you. You're orienting to okay, this is where I'm trying to get. All right, this I make a decision about how I'm going to move, and then you actually take the action, and then you you cycle all over again. And so, to me, um, that that OODA loop is is how you manage both the short term tactical and the the long term. You know, um, as um, as navigator on board a destroyer, you know we were leaving out of the Gulf and going across the Atlantic to um, back to home port. Um, so, you know, I had a, I had a plan, I had a, a, a path and a schedule and all that sort of thing that I laid out. Um, but, but that doesn't mean we just get on the path and go. I mean, you have to be looking at, okay, there's a merchant ship coming and, you know, this sort of thing and territorial waters and all that, you know, and, and under the warship and the Suez Canal, you have to time the uh, time, the transit and all that sort of thing. And so, um, you know, it's about keeping the long-term goal, in mind while you're going through the, the short-term machinations. And so um, I think that's where, um, you know, today with COVID um, here at the hospital, we're about making a difference in every life we touch. And so that's our, that's our vision. That's our goal. It's what we do. And so um, in everything that we do, COVID or not, we, we, we're trying to make a difference. And so that, that goal, um, you know, that place that we're, we're driving toward um, is, is always there as sort of our, our guiding you know, guidepost the, the the light that we're trying to drive to um, as we navigate these short-term uh, issues, 
And so, um, you know, that, that drives decisions. Like we just opened up our um, emergency department to allow people to have, um, you know, a person come with them if they need to. We had a lot of people staying out of the emergency department because they were, they didn't want to come alone. Um, they were scared that they might get sick in the emergency department. So we had to do a lot of work to, to help the community understand that we're taking precautions. And then now we've opened it up to where people can bring in a caregiver. And so we're starting to see people come into the emergency department now because um, th they feel like um, they can, um, they can, you know, be supported whenever they need to. There's someone there in the emergency department, whenever it's obviously a stressful, um, you know, time for a person. Um, so, so we're making a difference in the lives that we touch um, by, by simple things, by allowing visitors to come with them again. And so um, it's all about navigating those short-term uh, short challenges to reach the long-term goal. How are, and I love that, make a difference in every life. So basically you've come back to, to vision and mission. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny, when I was a midshipman at the Naval Academy, um, you know, the, the, the Admiral used to stand up and talk about his vision, and, and I remember just my eyes rolling and thinking, oh my gosh, what, 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 are we, what is he talking about? I, I'm just trying to get through finals, you know, um, but, but then whenever you get to a position where you're, where you're you know, senior, um, and, and you can make a decision essentially in any direction because you have that authority yeah. and, and, that, and, that, um, and that power, that vision is what makes sure that those those decisions are consistent. And so um, I really believe everything comes back to what are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to achieve? Yeah, it's it's funny that you, you don't really respect the, the vision mission. It takes a while for it to sink in. And, and I, I don't know what that what that is cognitively, what causes that. But, um, um, you know, it's the my my son uh, went to when he's going into high school, he goes, how do I know which one to choose? Because he was I said, well, you, you're going to go to a Jesuit high school because I want you to. And he's like, Dad, I, get, I want to go look at a few of them. And I, and I said, that was, I, I did want him to go to Jesuit high school, but I also you know, wanted him to go around. And so our biggest competitor, and this is a long story, but I'll make it short as I can. So up in Boston is where I went to school. And um, you know, the, the motto was um, uh, all about uh, growing men to make a difference in, in the world. And, 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 you know, you remember that it, you just remember it, but you don't know what it, how, what the impact is of it. You have a kid. And then he walks, I said, you'll know within five seconds if you want to go there and then find out what their vision is and then see if it resonates with you. And he found a school where it said men that matter, you know, building men that matter. And right. that, that made a difference for him. And I don't think he knows what it necessarily means, but sure enough that that institution matches like the, the decisions they make sort of line up with that. Right. Just from a, from a high school for boys. And, right. you know, and I've seen the impact of my vision, um, my, my company delivering on promises and customers for life. I didn't know the impact on that 20 years ago. And, and, uh, but it does make a difference in the decisions that people make. And so it's interesting to see how you're going back to, we're well, not going back to it, but how you guys are using that as a guiding light. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, now uh, what about this impact of, of, the, the human part of like wearing masks, like we talked about this a little bit from a, from a hospital environment. I, I just notice every time I'm going to the grocery store or even go to a restaurant now, like I, I can't, um, I have good hearing, but I literally, I think it, talk about new professions that get born. Like how do you, I, we must read a good 70% of interaction with people just by reading facial expressions. Mm -hmm. I'm, and how do you do that when you have a patient in there and you've got a nurse, you know, triage person coming in and you, you can't even understand what people are saying? Yeah, it's a, um, it's a challenge. Um, and so we're using, we're leveraging technology as much as we can to solve that, solve that challenge. And I think, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this before where, um, you know, technology is allowing people to have conversations. You and I are, are, talking virtually so we don't have to wear a mask whereas if we were doing this in person we would both probably be wearing a mask and so um, how does that change the dynamic between the two of us um, you know I can tell when you know you're you're you know engaged or excited about something I say or you know like oh god he's put me asleep so um, you know it's it's a yeah, it's, yeah. it's an important dynamic to share between two people and so um, we do leverage uh, technology iPads and cameras and that sort of thing to allow us to engage with um, with patients um, so that we can do that, but at the same time you lose something. And so I think it's going to be, um, 
really interesting, you know, looking forward, um, what's going to be the long-term impact of all this? How is this going to affect us as a, as a species in terms of, you know, our ability to communicate back and forth with each other? Um, you know, are, are we going to get to a point where we prefer technology because we can, we can see the facial expressions, even though we don't have that close physical contact, you know, how, how's that going to work? Um, and so, you know, how, how's it going to drive business relationships? How's it going to drive personal relationships? How's it going to drive, um, you, you know, the way businesses succeed? Um, you know, r restaurants, are they ever going to go back to, you know, the seating that they had before? Um, you know, <laughs> I was reading an article just recently about a restaurant in New York that opened up um, maybe two years ago that was completely outdoors. Um, and so, and, and all the tables are spread apart. You know, I think they said it was 30,000 square feet um, in, in this, you know, thing. And so um, COVID for them has been a boon because they're the one restaurant in Manhattan or wh wherever it is um, in inner city New York that, that can accommodate this w without skipping a beat. Is that where the future of dining is going? Yeah. Um, it, it's just a, it's really staggering to think about the implications of all of that. Um, you know, patients, whenever they're in a hospital and they're sick, um, and they're concerned about their, you know, their, their, their short-term future, their, their, their prognosis, um, you know, they, they desire that close physical contact to feel reassurance. Um, if we're not delivering that close physical contact, um, how's it going to impact the patient experience? How are they going to, how are they going to, um, how are they going to feel um, that that emotional connection that says, yeah, I, I, you know, someone believes in me and I'm going to fight this disease and I'm going to win. Um, yeah. so, you know, how, how do we overcome that? I, you know, those are all questions I think we don't know the answers to yet. Um, and I don't know that technology is going to solve all of them, but I certainly think technology is going to play a role. So as we as we wrap up, I, I, I want to know what your thoughts are on. So leadership now, when you're in because you're not the only leader there. There's a whole team of, of leaders running. And, and when you're in these leadership meetings, um, what's your presence there look like? Like if I was a fly in the wall, how do you lead in the midst of fear, you know, and uncertainty and doubts and unknowns? And I'm, I'm curious, because um, we talk about this intellectually and so clearly it's on your radar. And I'm curious if I was a fly in the wall, what, does your presence and um, an impact look like? So um, uh, leading in uncertainty, uh, it, you know, certainly is, is the sort of the, well, that's why we are leaders and that's why we're, that's why we have the positions that we do. And so, um, you know, it, it's all about, you know, uh, skating to where the puck is going to be, um, <laughs> you know, but, but, but the puck uh, you know, when that when that was originally offered, you know, the assumption was the puck would at least be on the ice. Um, now the puck could be in the concession stand. It could be out in the street. It could be in the parking lot. And so um, part of what I think, you know, our job as leaders, and this is what I, um, I strive to do, is to um, either um, try to reestablish some of those boundaries, try to get the puck back on the ice, um, or, uh, you, you know, redefine the playing field, listen, guys, the puck's never going to be back on the ice. So, um, so let's make sure that we start to build the team to play in the concession stand, in the parking lot, in the street. Um, and so um, that's the, that's the kind of, um, the, the kind of leadership I try to exert uh, amongst my peers and, and my staff and um, to try to try to look for, so, you know, we're an independent community hospitals, one of the, one of the few remaining, which I think is a great success story. Um, but, you know, we don't have uh, massive amounts of resources to commit to every project. And so it's about picking, um, picking the things that we can do that sort of um, fit as many of those potential futures as we can so that we economize our resources, we don't distract our folks, and that we do stay focused on making a difference in every life we touch. So, so in making the difference every life you touch in here, it could be that you're, you have the main ice that was the, uh, where the game was played, but maybe people want both options. So it, they want the telehealth and then they want the physical experience. And then you're going to figure out ways to navigate humanity within that to make that vision come true, make a difference in every life that you touch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it's, it's about um, being genuine um, being, um, positive, um, but, but not sort of, um, 
unbelievably positive. I mean, it always you know struck me that whenever whenever people almost denied reality um, as they as they talked about things, you're thinking, I'm not sure I'm following that guy because I'm not sure what cliff he's running off of. So um, <laughs> you got to make sure that you you know you're you're um, realistically positive. You know, um, and and people are hurting right now, so you have to acknowledge that. Got it. Well, this has been great, Phil. Um, I, I really appreciate your time coming on here. Is there anything that um, stuck out as we as we bring this to closure that you um, either wished I asked you or popped in your head? You're like, you know, I don't want to make this final point um, from our conversation today. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, there's a there's a story I like to share. Um, I broke my ankle in 2014, and uh, um, as luck would have it, in a month, I was scheduled to go to South Africa as part of my master's of business program. Um, it was a, a global master's program. And so we traveled all over the world to learn how different um, countries and companies operated. So anyway, um, I, I, you know, I've got a, I had surgery and I had, you know, all the sort of I'm in a wheelchair. And so uh, I'm in the airport in Johannesburg and I, and I had a layover, three hour layover. Well, in Johannesburg, um, if you're in a wheelchair, the way they handle your layover is they wheel you up to this sort of, um, you know, um, uh, area it looked like a petting zoo because just all the people in wheelchairs parked there you know um but um but okay you know and i was the only one that day um but they parked me in front of this huge wall uh there in the airport it must have been 30 40 feet tall with this huge um uh, mural on it and in the mural it said um if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together and of course, when you have three hours to sit there and stare at those words, you think about them a lot. <laughs> and being an English major, I couldn't help it. But, you know, I thought it was really, um, really impactful to me. And so I, I really try to remember that. But, you know, I think some people take away the wrong, the wrong lesson. They think that, well, well OK, then you, you, you always go together. I don't think that's true. As a leader, sometimes you have to go fast. You have to, you have to be prepared to go alone. Um, and you need to know when that's possible. And you need to understand how far you can go um, alone before you're going to need everyone else. So um, I, I really thought that that was a, um, a, an interesting um, uh, phrase. And so ever since then, I, I, I really, really believe that, it, you know, um, it, it's important to keep, you know, that just that short little, you know, phrase in yeah. mind and every decision I make. I love that. I love that because like you said, sometimes you got to go quick and might be just yourself and a couple, couple folks doing something innovative. Right. Um, but you're not, you're not even trying to bring the whole team around on right. long, but, but you're intentionally, you're intentional about, about that act. And then, yeah, if you wanna, exactly. and then as you go, want to go far and go organically and, and uh, you know, you need the whole team. So right. it, Exactly. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that might have to be a title of one of the mic, one of the posts you do. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. This has been great. I appreciate your time today. All right. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate it so much. You take care. You take care too. Bye.